Hi, yeah, I'm Hazel. I'm from Ireland, and um, I'm going to present my work with uh, David Malone on modeling the cost versus benefits of password advice policies. Good. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, collecting password advice, then modeling the value of a password policy, and then comparing the NIST 2003 and the NIST 2017 password policies. Um, so the NIST is the standards agency that puts out password authentication guidelines sometimes. Uh, good. So we started by collecting 269 pieces of password advice manually uh, from 21 different sources. And as we collected the advice, we kind of focused on the advice that was easy to find. So what a user or organization might find online when they're looking for password advice. And we basically realized that, um, yeah, so what we did is when we collected it, we divided it into categories. So every time we found a piece of advice that was in a certain category, we categorized it. And uh, so we ended up with 29 different categories of password advice. And what we did is we here we have them divided in what's kind of aimed at users and what's kind of aimed at organizations. Um, but the problem was that within each of these categories, it wasn't always like saying the same thing. So for example, in password reuse, you can see there's seven, six pieces of advice here. And what we did is we came up with two different statements that kind of summarize those, two pie those six pieces of advice. Uh, so the first three say, uh, use a different password for every website, and that comes under never reuse a password. And then the last three are add a couple of unique letters for each site, and that's alter and reuse passwords. And this was uh, interesting because we were able to see where there were contradictions in the advice that's given. So the last piece of advice there says users must not use a basic sequence of characters that is then partially changed based on some predictable factor. And we can say that that, see that, that contradicts alter and reuse passwords. Um, so we did this for all the different uh, categories, and I'm just going to talk about some of the interesting things uh, that came up out of it. Um, so this, this uh, so reuse, so alter and reuse passwords. Three said alter and reuse passwords, and three said don't. But we know from um, DAS in 2014 showed that 10% of non-identical password pairs can be guessed with 10 guesses, and 30% with 100 guesses. So altering and reusing, they're onto that. Um, don't reuse certain passwords. This was quite interesting, because a lot of researchers say, um, so maybe group your passwords together in like a high security, medium security, and low security groupings, and then only reuse passwords within those groupings, so that if a low security account is compromised, your high security ones are still safe. So a lot of advice said, don't reuse certain passwords. And we were like, OK. But really what they were saying is, don't reuse the passwords for our accounts. We don't care what you do with all the other accounts, but so long as you don't reuse our ones, that's fine. And five different places said this, and zero were against it. Uh, so password storage, hash and salt passwords, four were in support of this, and uh, seven were against, or at least seven said encrypt passwords. Um, so they contradict each other. Um, Phrases, sub substitute symbols for letters. So, you know, instead of an A, put an at. Uh, two were in favor of this and one was against. And uh, don't use words. 16 pieces of advice said don't use words, but we know from like, um, like leaked data sets that everyone really uses words for their passwords and zero were against. So that kind of shows that the advice maybe isn't having a great effect anyway. <laughs> um, so composition, uh, we found must include special characters. And seven said must include special characters. Five said don't. Um, enforce restrictions on characters. So this is the whole make sure you include an uppercase, a lowercase uh, letter, a uh, number, a symbol. And um, 12 different places said do that. And only one was against it. And the one that was against it are the new NIST 2017 guidelines, which are really well made and basically take into account all the research in the area. And it's just interesting that they managed to contradict all the other advice that we collected. Uh, password expiry, change your password regularly. Seven supported it and only four were against it, even though we know that it's really difficult for users and the security benefits are minimal. So basically, we have all these different pieces of advice. And what we're wondering is, as an organization, how can I decide what advice I'm going to put in my password policy? And we can see it's contradicting. So it's not entirely obvious if you just go out on the internet what's good and what's bad. So. 
a password policy is we define as basically everything that comes together and makes the policy a thing. So like, are you going to encrypt the channel? If so, how? Are you going to hash and salt passwords? Are you going to have rate limiting? What are your composition policies? It's everything that basically goes into the authentication. Um, so we wanted a way to decide what th that is going to be, what your password policy is going to be. So what we've come up with, well, this is pretty intuitive, that the quantifying the value of a password policy, so the value of a password policy is equal to the benefits of the policy minus the costs of the policy. Okay. So first we want to build a model for the costs. So what we did is we had all these different statements of advice, and for each one of those, we brainstormed all the different costs we could think of that were associated with them. So um, the first one there says, don't include personal information. And the costs we could think of associated with that were increased risk of forgetting, um, impossible and hard to, or hard to enforce, and inconvenience is a personal system for password generation. And then we say that that's irksome. Um, so basically, we did this for all the different advice statements we had. And then at the end, we'd come up with 10 different categories of costs. Um, and then we narrowed them down to seven because we found that there was overlap. So these are basically all the costs that we identified. Um, so in there is increased risk of forgetting, uh, user time or inconvenience, organizational time to enforce her program, uh, additional resources, increased computing power. Um, so we think these kind of sum up all the different costs that it can be associated with enforcing password advice. So what we did is then for each one of them, we changed it into like a monetary value. So for example, for increased risk of forgetting, the cost of a user forgetting a password is the time taken for the administrator to reset the password by the administrator's wages, um, and then the time the user is locked out by the user wages, and then we have some value u that basically is how much you care about the users. So if you don't really care that the user is locked out for 48 hours, then you know it doesn't really matter. But um, if you do, then so it's basically u is a value between zero and one. Um, so then you have also the probability that a user will abandon the site because they've forgotten their password, and you have that multiplied by the profit per user. So I mean, if you aren't getting any profit per user, that can be set to zero. Um, so basically, for each one of these different costs, one to seven, we have some probability of it occurring and some frequency with which it occurs. So for example, if you're talking about expiry, these costs are going to repeat every 90 days or something like that. OK, so that's the cost equation just in maths. That's just the probability times the cost category times the repetition. Uh, OK, so the benefits of a password policy. Um, so I mean, uh, the benefit of a password policy is basically the attacks that you're going to mitigate as a result of having the policy. Uh, so the way we've looked at the password policy is the losses without the password policy and the losses with the password po policy. And the hope is that the losses with the password policy are going to be less. Uh, so we have two things we needed to do here. The first one is calculate the loss as a result of a successful attack. And the other one is calculate the probability of a sex successful attack. OK, so calculate the loss as a result of a successful attack. Uh, so we kind of split this in two. So the first part is L NPL1. And that's just the loss as a result of one user being compromised, multiplied by the number of users and the probability that the, of compromise. Um, so that's basically if an individual is compromised, what's the loss? But we also have some value that says that if this fraction of users in the organization is compromised, then we can consider the entire system to be compromised. And we set that value as alpha. So when a fraction alpha of the end users are compromised, then the whole system is down. Uh, so we just have this is basically going to be a normal distribution is our assumption. So we have the probability that the number of users compromised is greater than or equal to the fraction alpha of the number of users. And then you have some value for the whole system. OK, so then what we wanted to do is calculate the probability of a successful attack. So what we did is we took from the NIST 2017 the list of all the different types of attacks. And we basically have a probability of each one of these occurring. Uh, so this was the most difficult part, because for some reason, no one wanted to give me all their t attack statistics. Uh, so basically, like we need to know how often an online guessing attack occurs, and we need to know the success rate of that. And we need that for each one of these. Because I mean, if an online guessing attack has a success rate of like, let's say 10%, and a theft has a success rate of 50%, but an online guessing attack ha happens like 200 times a minute, then 
and a theft happens once a month, then you need to have those weighted in relation to each other. Um, so yeah, basically we took it from the, the Verizon, I think 2017 data breach report, because they had uh, a list of all the different types of attacks, the vectors of the attack, um, and how often they occurred. And uh, one of our reasonings was that we wanted to have all the, the statistics from the same document, because then at least they make sense in relation to each other. Um, Cool. So yeah, basically our benefits equation then is the probability of attack success without the policy minus the probability of attack success with the policy multiplied by the loss as a result of a successful attack. Cool. So now that we have our benefits equation and we have our costs equation, uh, we should be able to compare two password policies. So actually this was kind of the, the incentive for looking into this in the first place, was at the time, the 2000 and I think it was the 2017 NIST advice was in draft format, uh, so there was a lot of reviews going around about it, and there was also a lot of judgment on the 2003 password policy, and we kind of thought there should be a way that we can quantifiably say what the benefits and of each policy are and what the costs of each policy are and compare them um, like mathematically, yeah. So the NIST 2017 password policy, we're just looking at level one, so this is the lowest level of authentication, and uh, this is kind of our interpretation of some of it. So some of it, it says you can use this or this, um, and so for example, like the limit consecutive fail login attempts to 100, uh, it could be any value less than 100, but we just took 100. Um, so yeah, NIST 2017 says the length should be less than eight, blacklist compromised passwords, uh, limit consecutive fail login attempts to 100, hash and salt passwords, and send messages over an encrypted channel. Um, NIST 2003 password policy, again at level one, says there's no composition requirements at this level. Uh, the probability of guessing, successfully guessing the password should not exceed one in 1,024 1, guesses. And at the back in the appendix, it describes this as basically the rate limiting should be, should be set, so that, that, that's true. And then you have passwords stored using a reversible encryption or a one-way hash, and no requirement to block offline decryption by eavesdroppers. And this is kind of basically the, a challenge response type of authentication is what it's describing. Okay, so first thing we want to do is we want to look at the benefits. So the purple is the benefits for the NIST 2017, and the green is the benefits for the NIST 2003. And what we've done is on the x-axis, we just have the number of users that are in an organization. So we've tried out loads of different values for the number of users. And then each one of the different lines is basically the, uh, the weighting on users. So it's going from zero to one. And what we can see here is that the weighting on users has no effect on whether you're going to mitigate an attack or not. Um, so you can see that at uh, 100, uh, if you have 100 users and you use the NIST 2003 policy, then your uh, benefit is going to be of having that policy is going to be about five hundred thousand uh, dollars, and uh, the benefit of having the NIST 2017 policy is about one point five million. Um, so that's already a good sign for the NIST 2017 policy. Uh, the next thing we looked at is the costs. So the costs of the NIST 2017 policy is the purple uh, right down the bottom. Uh, so you can see that across the board, the 2017 policy has lower costs. Uh, but what's also interesting is this is where the weighting on users comes into play. And you can see that it's actually in order of, for the NIST 2003, you can see that up the very top is the, if you have a weight of one on your users, you have the highest cost. If you have the weight zero on your users, you're right down here and it's going up linearly. Uh, so that's quite interesting. And it kind of shows us immediately that the NIST 2003 policy is highly dependent on users and the costs are mainly borne by the users, which is something we're kind of trying to come away from, uh, which is good again. Uh, so basically, the last thing then we did is we uh, compared the benefits minus the costs uh, for the two policies, and we have this diagram. And so the benefits minus the costs, we're looking for positive because we want the benefits to exceed the costs. And you can see the zero line up there, so up near the top. And in all cases, the NIST 2017 policy stays above the zero line. So that means the benefits of putting the policy in place outweigh the costs associated with the policy. 
uh, which is, again, a good sign. And uh, the NIST 2003 policy, you can see, basically is getting worse and worse and worse. And I think after 1,000 users, it goes below zero. So the benefits don't outweigh the costs of enforcing the policy. So there was a lot of things we kind of took as uh, like we fed in as like data to this. So for example, we took like the value of the policy. We took, um, so I think, oh, the value of the organization, sorry. Uh, then we took the, um, basically how much they pay their users, how much they pay their administrators, whether they pay their users at all, because obviously if they're external, that doesn't apply. And um, the idea is that an organization can use this and they can tailor it to their specific needs. Because if I have uh, 10 users, I might want a very different uh, security usability trade-off than if I have 100,000 users. And if my, if my product is users, then I'm going to want something very different uh, from if my product is healthcare, for example. Uh, so the idea is that you can tailor it uh, to, like an organization can tailor it to their needs and find out what the best policy is for them. Cool. So in conclusion, um, advice on what a password policy should include is often contradictory, uh, but organizations should be able to choose a policy that suits their situation. Our model allows organizations to determine what policy is best for them, given their security and usability needs. Thank you. <laughs>